um i'll just extend a warm welcome to all our participants today i'm bijetri roy and uh, this is ebc learnings webinar on attachment adjudication and confiscation of property under the prevention of money laundering act so uh, for those who are not aware ebc learning is the educational initiative of ebc and our objectives of ebc are to help remove uh, hurdles from legal education empower people to make life changing moves and more importantly to help you learn and win now as you can see this session is live and is also simultaneously live on our youtube channel which is ebc learning now before we start um i'll just uh, briefly tell our participants that we will have a q and a session towards the end of the initial discussion so i would suggest that you all please write your questions in the chat tab which is located at the bottom of your player and uh, before we begin with our session today i would like to introduce our guest pallavi pratap uh, welcome to ebc learning pallavi thank you vijaythri for having me here it's really exciting to be here finally talking to you again yes and uh, so basically um, i'll just uh, briefly tell everyone uh, who is pallavi now pallavi is an advocate on record uh, supreme court of india and she is uh, the managing partner of pratap and company which is a full service law firm in delhi she has uh, advised clients on a wide range of matters including ipr trade remedies adr including international and domestic arbitration commercial litigation insolvency and bankruptcy litigation among other matters that she does from time to time now the topic for today uh, the prevention of money laundering act which we generally call pmla it was enacted to prevent the menace of money laundering and to provide for confiscation of property which has been derived from this kind of money laundering now there is a separate process for trial of the offence of money laundering which i'm sure pallavi is going to explain as well uh, while the uh, the entire procedure for the property involved in money laundering has been provided in the pmla itself so pallavi uh, there are some of these common terms which we generally come across with respect to pmla so uh, um, the three of them that you've already used in our uh, in the name of the topic as well attachment adjudication and confiscation so uh, if you could uh, start by explaining these terms first and then probably explain the legal position and then the cases in this regard also uh, like we discussed earlier i was uh, asking you about uh, this came, uh, case that i came across uh, the jsw steels case the enclad case so uh, towards the end of your discussion if you could probably also give us a brief view on the jsw steels versus mahindra kumar khandelwal uh, judgment um, and uh, for all our, all our participants please uh, start writing your questions in the q and a tab so that towards the end of the lecture i can read out the questions and uh, pallavi uh, can answer your questions and uh, towards the end of uh, today's session i'll just take a few uh, minutes of everyone's time and i'll uh, give you a virtual tour of our website ebc learning so uh, now pallavi you can uh, start with your presentation thank you so much uh, bijetri i think it's a very interesting uh, topic that you gave me um, i think pmla um, with the, with the kind of uh, uh, you know the cases which are going on just now in the country we see that there is a lot of relevance of this uh, just now and also anybody who intends to practice um, uh, you know before the pmla um, adjudicating authority or um, as far as prosecution is concerned uh, before the concerned special courts i think it is important for um, all of us to also know what is uh, prevention of money laundering act even though the act has been around for uh, nearly 20 years now and um, we have seen various amendments which has which have happened uh, to the pmla act we've also seen the evolution that has happened as far as the act was concerned and there's a very small actually a presentation that i thought that i will give so that quickly um, every one can get refreshed to exactly what we will be talking about um, there are specific questions that you've asked me about uh, defining uh, you know attachment confiscation and of course adjudication so i intend to uh, cover those specific parts as far as uh, my presentation is concerned so i'll just start with the screen share if uh, i can be enabled to share my screen please
Thank you. I'll just start one second. So are you able to see um, the screen share, uh, Bajitri? Yeah, Pallavi. I can All right, wonderful. So um, I will actually just um, get started with what exactly is, uh, uh, you know, anti-money laundering or AML as we call it. And what was the intention of uh, PMLA in terms of why was it introduced and um, what was the reason for uh, bringing about PMLA? And that was primarily to, uh, you know, prevent money laundering, which is which was happening um, across uh, the country and not just um, locally, but we've seen it um, a lot of money laundering, which is happening internationally. For instance, if we look at um, you know, some specific uh, cases, uh, for instance, the Yes Bank case, um, or um, different other cases uh, which are tagged along, you would see that because of some uh, uh, money laundering that took place in uh, Brazil, for instance, uh, the assets of uh, companies in India are getting um, attached as a result of some money laundering which took place in Brazil. And that is primarily because this money laundering web is um, is so um, spread across that it is um, very difficult to ascertain as to uh, where uh, this is um, taking place and also to ascertain um, who are the culprits just now who are involved in such, such a case. So now coming to Prevention of Money Laundering Act, um, PMLA was enacted to prevent the menace of money laundering and to provide for confiscation of property derived from or involved in money laundering. So uh, this is um, primarily the intention which was there. Now, very interestingly, uh, why was it that money laundering uh, came into being and how is it that you differentiate any attachment that is taking place? So coming to money laundering specifically, whosoever directly or indirectly attempts to indulge or knowingly assists, or knowingly is a party, or is actually involved in any process or activity connected to proceeds of crime, including its concealment, possession, acquisition, or use, and projecting or claiming it as untainted property shall be guilty of offense of money laundering. So coming to your first question where you were saying, um, what is attachment? And uh, uh, if I have to define it, how is it that I will define it? Um, attachment as per the PMLA Act is given as, um, if you would read it, it's in uh, definition section 2.1.D, where it says attachment means prohibition of transfer, conversion, disposition, or movement of property by an order issued under chapter 3. But what is it that is going to be attached? What is going to be attached is the property which has been brought or any asset which has been brought as a result of proceeds of money laundering. So let's say an ex person receives some sort of, uh, you know, uh, money in their account, which is as a result of money laundering and he or she invests it into a specific asset then that asset will be considered to be bought as a result of the proceeds of uh, money laundering or proceeds of this crime. And that specific asset will then be attached or confiscated because it will be considered to be as a result of the proceeds of the crime, uh, which is the money laundering. Now, what is attachment under PMLA? Um, PMLA provides separate provisions relating to attachment and confiscation of property that may be involved in money laundering and a separate procedure for the trial of the offense of money laundering. Now here, if you look at this definition, you come also to the definition as far as adjudication is concerned. Now PMLA is a very interesting act where you would see that just like you have, um, you know, um, there were specific uh, special provisions or special enactments which took place uh, uh, on similar lines. I mean, um, for instance, if you look at Income Tax Act, or um, if you look at uh, something like um, 
you know, the NDPS Act or the Customs Act. Now there is something called as, uh, you know, the uh, the part where adjudication takes place, which is a which is a quasi judicial authority. But when you look at the prosecution, there are special courts which are made for prosecution. So this is where the difference lies. Typically, when you look at any offense that takes place, there is normally something which is called as you go to the court and that the entire adjudication and prosecution takes place in the court only. But here, separate authorities have been created. There is an authority which is going to only look into the adjudication aspect of it. And then there are special courts which are only going to look into the prosecution part of it. So this is the differentiation that Bijetri, we were talking about uh, the other day. This is why this special enactment actually comes in handy. So coming to PMLA, uh, attachment, like I said, would always be or confiscation will always be of property, which is as a result of the proceeds of crime. And that adjudication will be uh, twofold. One is the adjudication part of it through the adjudicating authority. And the other one is the prosecution part of it through special courts. Now let's come to provisional attachment. This is something which is, um, you know, um, a lot of times we consider this to be a boon and bane kind of a situation because uh, PMLA, of course, has been given extensive rights. Now, these extensive rights also, uh, I'm sure, bring with them uh, a lot of responsibility, which unfortunately we do not see um, uh, when you are practicing, um, uh, you know, uh, in the PMLA adjudicating authority, you will see a lot of times that these provisional attachments that happen are um, done blindly. So for instance, uh, there is something called as a term which is says, which is reason to believe. Now, if the director or a deputy director has reasons to believe that this particular property is as a result of the proceeds of crime, uh, in this case, be money laundering, they can attach it. And this, as we will see in JSW Steels when we talk about it, we will see how uh, these provisional attachments are causing greater harms um, to, let's say, an asset which is under IBC or to assets which were never part of the proceeds of crime but have been, without, the, without application of mind, attached as far as Section 5 is concerned. I'll just very quickly read this part. Uh, Section 5 of the PMLA provides that a director or another officer not below the rank of a deputy director as appointed under the PMLA has the power to provisionally attach a person's property if they have reason to believe that the person is in possession of proceeds of any crime and that such proceeds are likely to be dealt with in any manner which may result in frustrating any proceedings under the PMLA. So like I said, an attachment order can be, uh, you know, uh, passed, uh, which could be, you know, if they have a reason to believe that there is, um, you know, there is a possibility that this asset was um, as a result of proceeds of any crime. Now, this is important also because when we look at Section 5, there is a specific definition which is given of who could uh, you know, attach um, the property. Now, if you read section five, it says director or any other officer not below the rank of deputy director. So there is a case uh, where Punjab and Haryana High Court has very clearly indicated that any attachment which is done by someone who is of a rank below than the director and a deputy director they will then, uh, you know, that entire attachment will go away because there will be an illegality as far as uh, law is concerned because it will be bad in law. If somebody um, other than the rank of de director or deputy director, I'm repeating this again because this is very important. A lot of times when we are arguing uh, matters as far as attachment is concerned, you have to see if, uh, because these are intricate things and sometimes you one ignores it and one doesn't realize that these are the most important points which can then help you as far as uh, 
getting a getting a provisional attachment uh, lifted is concerned so i feel that um, this section 5 specifically in, in any case if this is more from a practicing lawyer's perspective but if you ever get a matter which is of attachment do look at section 5 first see if the attachment order is in compliance with what section 5 of the pmla lays down now um, it, this is in uh, continuation to that after duly conducting the adjudication process and hearing any aggrieved parties the adjudicating authority can confirm the attachment the question that arises is what happens when secured lenders have rights on the same property now this second part i will actually discuss a little later um, also specifically as far as jsw is concerned but let me come again on the first part when we have an attachment order or um, uh, um, you know where we see that there is a 17 section 17 or uh, one which is in coming into play you have to ensure that section 174 which says that within 30 days of a show cause notice being there the the within 30 days it should be um, you know adjudicated by the adjudicating authority if that is not done then that will be considered to be bad in law and that the attachment uh, or the order of freezing of account for instance will then be bad in law so any application of 174 has to be filed and as far as 174 application is concerned it has to be filed before the adjudicating authority who has to then adjudicate upon that specific application within 30 days this should be done if it is not done then your attachment has to automatically be considered as bad in law this was uh, um, held in sudeep kaur sahani um, uh, case i can share the uh, the the uh you know the case details later on over here now uh this was primarily about uh let's say as far as 174 is concerned but also about the second part as far as secured lenders are concerned we've seen that happen uh, a lot of times especially uh for instance pmla or ed related uh, uh you know uh, the procedures which are followed one will also notice that so many times you know that um, gets uh, you know countered by surfacey um, surfacey act because there may be a possibility that the ed or P under pmla may have attached uh, or have may have had a provisional attachment rather of an asset which where already surfacey proceedings were going on so this judgment i believe is extremely important uh, indian bank versus government of india ministry of finance where you know madras high court had uh, observed that pmla does not take into the account the plight of victims of crime and this this is happening um, quite a bit and we are noticing this um, in so many matters i mean in for instance yes bank only if you look at it there was a phase where uh, last year in february I, or march i believe where the accounts of uh, you know account holders were frozen because they were they could only share some 50000 or they could only withdraw some 50000 rupees now you know these the, the, this is what is happening to the victims of the crime it is not the perpetrator who then um, uh, you know gets punished more often it is always the victims so noting the intent of the pmla the court held that this lacuna in the pmla cannot result in the banks being left high and dry and the court allowed the bank to maintain its claim under the surfacey act even though the property had been provisionally attached so that claim does not really go away it is it it still is there even though there is a provisional uh, attachment order because that attachment order will be adjudicated and a final understanding will come as to whether or not that prop, prop, that particular attachment was as a result of proceeds of crime or not now uh, similarly um, this uh, matter this case was also very important which is called as chief manager syndicate bank versus deputy director pmla now the appellate tribunal under the pmla upheld the order confirming the um, provisional attachment and held that the bank would have another opportunity to prove its case during the course of confiscation proceedings this this matter um, was very interesting as far as um, 
if you if you look at the intricacies of it was concerned but at the end of the day pmla adjudicating authority has been talking about uh, pmla prevailing over every other act we will when we talk about jsw steels we will see how this conflict is brought for and how the honorable nclat has um, adjudicated upon um, this this conf this conflict that happens between a secured creditor uh, or an ibc proceeding and uh, a pmla proceeding parallelly taking place now coming to section 54 of the pmla it states that provisional attachment shall not prevent the person interested in the enjoyment of the immovable property attached from such enjoyment and the indian bank case suggests that banks will have a right to challenge such provisional attachment and claim their rights however from the pmla subsequent provisions and their interpretation by the judiciary it is clear that such enjoyment is subject to subsequent confiscation of the property under section 9 of the pmla now this is where i think for all the practitioners it is important that we understand what is the difference between section 5 and section 9 of the pmla because when you look at the, the a plain reading itself of section 5 and section 9 gives you a very good understanding of where uh, what what exactly is confiscation i would actually want to read the entire section but i think uh, it will be difficult for uh, anyone to understand exactly what uh, um, section 9 looks like but primarily anybody who wants to uh, you know practice under pmla one thing which is of if which is of a lot of importance is always looking at section 5 uh um, then of course section 8 and section 9 as a matter of fact the entire chapter chapter 3 is very important and i would want everyone to make a note of it that chapter 3 is very important as far as uh, attachment of a property is concerned or adjudication is concerned and very interestingly whatever is the reading a plain reading of the section that gives you a very good understanding and you can find out um, areas where um you know the lacuna lies as far as an order or a provisional attachment order is concerned and how you would want it to be uh, fought out as far as adjudicating authority is concerned now this one happens to be a very recent uh, judgment it was this here only when um, you know uh, this was primarily about property acquired prior to the commission of criminal activity which cannot be attached under pmla now this i think um, anybody who's practicing uh, as far as pmla is concerned one would have always come across uh, uh, these these uh, matters because uh, what in my experience at least what i've seen is that um, when when pmla is sending an attachment order they will find out all the asset that one owes um, and then they will start sending attachment orders against everybody uh, again sorry against every asset which is there now so many times at least 90% of the times you will see that these are blanket attachment orders without application of mind where these these assets have never been bought because of the proceeds of crime as a matter of fact i can cite um, one of my um, one of the matters that i'm doing where um, the the where my client has a property from before uh, uh, joining the place where uh, you know pmla acquisitions have come in and that happens to be his ancestral property and that also has been attached so how is it that you know without application of mind you can attach anything and everything so here uh, punjab and Har haryana high court and you would find a lot of good judgments actually coming from punjab and haryana high court as far as pmla is concerned where it was held that the properties involved in appeals were purchased in 1991 and 2012 respectively whereas the alleged scheduled offence was committed in february and march 2013 thus the property in question could not be treated or declared as proceeds of crime so this is i think one of the good arguments that we always take as far as uh, you know when the property is attached which we believe we have reasons to believe that uh, uh, that it was not part of proceeds of crime but something which was um, Uh, brought many years back before uh, uh, a specific money laundering act was had taken place 
Now coming to confiscation and vesting, section nine of the PMLA states that when an order of confiscation has been made under section 8.5 of the PMLA, this is section eight, if you would remember, is about adjudication. All rights and the title in such property shall vest absolutely in the central government, free from all encumbrances. Now this, I think, is uh, section nine is always what is considered to be uh, very detrimental. As a matter of fact, um, uh, I was told about a story that uh, ED had actually con bought about a, um, a Santro car, which was many years back. And all of us know that Santro do, does not really have too much of value. But, uh, you know, they, they, they bought it, the ED officials, and then um, because it is supposed to be valued at 3x, so there was an X valuation which was done. Now, what is, uh, what is ED going to do out of the con uh, uh, confiscation of a Santro car is something that is for all of us to see. But these are little things that we've been noticing that, you know, of course it vests with, with the central government, but confiscating things or confiscating assets which are not worthy of it is only, um, you know, it looks like that it is only a process that they are trying to misuse instead of making it any good. Um, when you look at the practical aspect of uh, implementation of a PMLA. Coming back to section nine, uh, however, the proviso to section nine states that if the adjudicating authority is of the opinion that any encumbrance on the property or leasehold interest has been created with a view to defeat the provisions of chapter five of the PMLA, it may by order declare such encumbrance or leasehold interest to be void and thereupon the aforesaid property shall vest in the central government free from such encumbrances or leasehold interest. Now, this is a very popular argument as far as section nine is concerned that, uh, that the, um, you know, the, the PMLA uh, or the prosecution typically has um, saying that, you know, if even if uh, like, I'll just quote this, um, that it may by order declare such encumbrance or leasehold interest to be void and thereupon the aforesaid property shall vest in the central government. Now, vesting of such property uh, uh, in central government is, like I said, is not doing a lot of good because we are seeing that so many of these properties actually have um, encumbrances which are um, uh, attached to it. As a result of which we've seen that a lot of financial creditors then have, uh, they, they would then have their NPAs which are incre increasing. So um, uh, when we are looking at, you know, a specific act or a specific law, trying to come and rescue uh, the citizens from a certain bad act, at the same time, these laws are also causing, uh, uh, you know, problems which are then manifesting in a different manner. I think this is where uh, maybe the lawmakers have to look at how they can uh, reduce this uh, manifestation of problems which is happening. Uh, and I will come to JSW Steels and I think that will be a very interesting discussion that we will have. Um, but coming back to um, section nine and of course section eight, based on the above, it may be inferred that the adjudicating authority also has the power to hear an aggrieved person under section eight two. Uh, which will include a lender and determine whether it has a valid interest over the property. And this happens typically, but uh, I think PMLA, um, uh, the adjudicating authority also looks at uh, all these assets um, from a perspective that in no manner, any proceed of crime should go out of it. So one would always have, uh, uh, you know, a suspicion which is um, around any such aggrieved person who suddenly pops up and says that, you know, I was a lender and I have valid interest against a property. Now a lender would therefore have the option of proving the bona fides of its transaction before the adjudicating authority. And in such a situation, a lender may not have any right to the impugned property, but only have a contractual right of recourse. Like I said that, you know, it is, um, of course, with suspicion that, in, uh, that the adjudicating authority will see 
um, uh, will look at this lender and of course the bona fides will have to be uh, proven. And very interestingly, this will then have contractual, uh, the, the lender will only have contractual rights then, uh, uh, um, uh, contractual rights which will flow to the lender. Whereas, um, like I said, the property uh, will, with it being encumbrance free, will actually go to the to the central government, and it, the rights will vest with the central government. Now, uh, coming to third party rights in the attached property, this is one of the biggest concern, and I think 60-70% um, of the litigation that we see actually happens as far as third party rights are concerned. Now, you would see in any attachment, mostly there is some kind of a third party right which is there. So the issue of bona fide third party claiming legal rights over the attached property by ED and a PMLA came up before the Delhi High Court and Deputy Director uh, Department of Enforcement Delhi versus Axis Bank and others, whereby it held that an order of attachment under PMLA is not illegal per se. If a secured creditor has no charge on the property under RDBA and Surfacy Act. However, mere attachment of property under PMLA does not is ipso facto render illegal a prior charge or encumbrance of a secured creditor. Now here, uh, what is also of importance is to note that you know the charge, when you're creating a specific charge, um, so many times a charge remains unregistered. So if, uh, uh, my my uh, recommendation is always that you know if there is a charge that is to be created it should always be registered because be it ibc proceedings or company act proceeding or pmla you will see that the registered charge will always be uh, providing your legal remedy a lot of times people just have a charge which is created which is not registered i feel that uh, always creates a problem specifically in the eyes of law now, um, like I said that, um, uh, and I will reiterate this part, um, which is that mere attachment of property under PMLA will not render illegal a prior charge or an encumbrance which is created by a secured creditor. Now, uh, this is a specific uh, question, which I think um, the, the long and short of the entire chapter three actually comes down to this, which is Another moot issue in such situations is whether after approval of a resolution plan under IBC, is it open for ED to attach assets of corporate debtor on ground of money laundering by promoters, directors, or employees? So uh, we come to JSW Steel here, but I am not going to deliberate so much on this just now. Uh, this is something that Vijay3 and I will be uh, talking about in the end of our session. Moving on, uh, property with non-offenders. If let's say, for instance, I am uh, an offender as far as PMLA is concerned, and uh, I have a specific property which is with, uh, let's say, my sister who's not an offender, then what is the rights which percolate out of it? Uh, property with non-offenders, it's very clear that sections 8, 2, and 9 of the PMLA were challenged in the case of B. Ram Raju. And Andhra Pradesh High Court upheld their constitutionality, it says, uh, it observed that in view of the fact that targeting the proceeds of crime and providing for attachment and confiscation of the proceeds of crime is conceived to be the appropriate legislative strategy. This is the intent of the legislature as we've been, uh, as we've seen. We are not persuaded to the view that attachment and confiscation of property constituting proceeds of crime in the possession of a person not accused or charged of an offense under section three constitutes an arbitrary or unconstitutional legislative prescription. So it is very clear. And I think this judgment, specifically this operative part, very clearly mandates about confiscation as far as non-offender non is concerned. Now, um, this is basically a specific uh, 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 you know, a sort of a chart that we've made to uh, make it clear as far as uh, money laundering is concerned. Uh, you would see that provisional attachment is under section uh, 5.1, freezing of property is under 17.1a, and seizure of proceeds of crimes is um, section 17.1 and 
Now, if you would look at this, um, the first one here, uh, as far as seizure of proceeds of crime is concerned, the complaint by the ED goes to the adjudicating authority for retention or continuation in case of seized or frozen property. So a lot of times seized property could include a laptop or a mobile phone or could include frozen property. For instance, it could be a bank account, which could be frozen. Now, either the property is released, which is um, section 8253. Uh, so basically section 8 clause 2, like we talk, talked about, it is the adjudication part of it. But what really is the procedure in practical is that the adjudicating authority first confirms the attachment or the seizure uh, or freezing, whatever is the case, uh, under section 8.3, which is the uh, adjudication thing. Now, then there is an appeal which lies to the appellate tribunal by aggrieved within 45 days, uh, which is section 26.3. This maybe we can discuss um, in a separate uh, uh, talk because appellate and prosecution actually happens to be um, uh, a different uh, ball game altogether. Here we have only we are only looking at what happens as far as adjudicating authority is concerned. Then appellate tribunal confirms or set aside the order and appeal to high court has to, can be filed within 60 days. This is given in section 45. This is just a very, um, uh, you know, a simple snapshot which is given over here, but it is typically you would see it does not really adhere to the, the specific timelines which are given. So um, we've just finished this part. Um, I will just stop the screen sharing and uh, then maybe... Uh, Bijetri can come in and we can talk about JSW. Yeah, Pallavi, uh, the presentation was really interesting. Uh, thank you for that. Now, um, going back to my question on uh, the case. So, yes. uh, I would just like to have a brief view on the case from your end as to... Uh, like how it is related to our topic for discussion today and uh, what do we uh, I mean what should we really uh, look into while we are probably you know analyzing or reading that particular case and how uh, it's relevant yeah I think uh, we we actually discussed about JSW steals also and I think um, what was what had happened was and uh, this is very interesting is that uh, JSW Steels, um, there was a case which was filed and it uh, went to NCLAT where uh, the ED had attached the property, the property of the corporate debtor. Now, uh, if, if the property of the corporate debtor is attached and there is a resolution plan which has already been, uh, you know, uh, finalized as far as uh, uh, the CIRP process is concerned, once the resolution plan is finalized, then what happens is that the resolution, the successful resolution applicant is going to send that money to the resolution, uh, the, the corporate debtor's account. Now, if the entire property gets seized of the, uh, you know, corporate debtor, then what remains, what will the resolution applicant then, you know, work upon one? And secondly, how is it that, you know, we've always um, envisioned IBC to be a very time bound proceed? proceeding and we've always understood that you know IBC is basically there to come and rescue uh, companies which have really lost uh, their path so for that to happen it was important that you know everything was time bound one and secondly it should be hurdle free but there was definitely a doubt which comes into the mind of people that maybe you know uh, companies would deliberately go under IBC and some uh, related party would probably come rescue them and that all the proceeds will then go back to the, the offender who was there, be, being, let's say, for instance, the promoter of the corporate debtor. Um, so this has always been there in the mind, in the back of the mind, as far as uh, IBC proceedings were concerned. And we've seen Nariman, Justice Nariman actually giving some wonderful uh, um, or, uh, you know, judgments as far as uh, SR was concerned. I think uh, 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 especially, you know, the new metal and all of these, these were, I think, um, very important judgments that came. Now, uh, this goes before NCLAT and the NCLAT says that there are two different uh, submissions that I'm seeing. 
one i'm seeing is from ministry of corporate affairs who says that no ibc is very good and ibc should prevail and there is section 230 which provides for prevalence of ibc or having overriding effect over every other law which is there in the country that is agreed then comes uh, uh, ed and ed says that no i am going to confiscate because this is all proceeds of crime and therefore i am the one who should be <coughs> confiscating these in order to keep it with me because you know uh, ultimately the 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 asset lies with the central government so there was this conflict which was there and uh, just before justice mukhopadhyay so justice mukhopadhyay says okay fine you decide up amongst yourselves and you tell me uh, whose uh, you know submissions will prevail so while this matter was going on finally the the government last year then uh, bought about an amendment to ibc and where they said in section 321a that uh, you know um, ibc proceedings will of course prevail and interestingly they also said that uh, uh, i will just uh, point out that specific paragraph because i really like that paragraph but they say that uh, and this i'm quoting in so far as um, corporate debtor or its assets are concerned after the completion of cirp a statutory process under the ibc there cannot be any attachment or confiscation of the assets of corporate debtor by any enforcement agencies after approval of resolution plan so now the criteria was very clear that if the resolution plan has been approved then there cannot be any attachment of the corporate debtor you want to attach go attach the promoter or any employee who has been found to be guilty as far as pmla is concerned but you cannot attach the properties of the corporate debtor so this was a uh, uh, one very important um, step forward which is given as far as uh, the judgment is also concerned then what happened was that then ed comes back and says that no no this ordinance even though it has come uh, i would i say that this is all prospective in nature there is nothing which is retrospective now there was another pandora's box that is opened up where people are thinking now what do you do because most of the resolution plans were actually approved as far as 2019 was concerned everything was approved from before so then uh, uh, justice mukhopadhyay has written a very interesting um, paragraph i'll just quote that i'm sorry i'm taking so much time but uh, this is para 45 uh, page 50 of the nclet order he says Union of India had unequivocally stated that after the completion of CIRP there cannot be any threat of criminal proceedings against the corporate debtor or attachment or confiscation of its assets by an investigating agency after approval of resolution plan this is something that i just quoted in any event by virtue of section 238 of IBC which has uh, the ibc has an overriding effect over anything inconsistent there within any other law accordingly it is clear that subsequent promulgation of the ordinance is merely a clarification in this respect and therefore it is expressly evident that the ordinance being clarificatory in nature must be applicable retrospectively and he defines it and this i think is the long and short of the entire jsw steels um, argument even though the appeals have been filed before the honorable supreme court and it is still pending before the honorable chief justice of india there is no such stay which is operating just now at least in my knowledge i don't uh, i don't think that there is a stay um, there were some provisional attachment orders which were also stayed at that point in time and i think the stay continues they are going to be uh, listening this matter finally in january middle of january so i think we will have a clarity but this this is very clear that you know there was an intent by the government but two different departments of the government itself are fighting over which prevails over which so i think this this was one part that i wanted to add as far as uh, jsw steel was concerned and i think anybody who is a practicing uh, pmla advocate should definitely find jsw steel and rely upon it as much as possible Okay, uh, so um, I think we can start taking the questions, right? Sure, please go ahead. Yeah. All right. Now the first question is from uh, Naman. Uh, okay, so the question is uh, that his background is MBA in finance, and he plans on having 
a career in international anti money laundering work for example at fatf un or at the national level so what qualifications or expertise can he build upon in the next few years and uh, he would uh, like some guidance from you on that okay this is very interesting question but uh, um, i see that you are an mba in finance uh but is it that you want to go into the litigation of pmla uh, this is not clear i mean then if if you want to go into the litigation side of it then you will probably have to uh, get a law degree for yourself uh because i will only be able to give you an understanding as far as litigation is concerned and my first uh, uh guidance would be that you um, get yourself an llb because i think it's it's not just um, well actually the economic international finance side of it well then i think there are many uh, uh, you know uh, courses which are given i'm not very sure about which colleges abroad have these courses but because money laundering is something which like i said is spread over um, continents just now um, there are too many um, uh, you know there are many colleges um, at least abroad i know of uh, where i would not know the names of them but um, i know of people who've got these um, you know uh, there are specializations which have been done into money laundering however if you if you are specifically looking at litigation then getting a law degree is a good idea or mba in uh, finance if you've done you will see the application of a, uh, uh, mba finance because i also happen to be an mba finance uh, my, uh, i don't see so much of an application of an mba finance as far as this is concerned but more application of being a law graduate which uh, uh, brings about support as far as um, you know these kind of matters are concerned okay uh, now another question is if any property is sold based on forgery then will the complaint be filed with the police and ed will both the properties that is the property which is sold off and the property being purchased by the seller be confiscated so the the as far as forgery is concerned how can you go before ed at least in my opinion it is not the ed which is there unless you have something to show that this this uh, this property was as a result of proceeds of crime the complaint will definitely lie before police and that is where you will have to go as far as forgery is concerned now uh, uh, and you will find a proper adjudication before the police instead of ed because ed already is overwhelmed with uh, the number of matters that they are doing however if you can prove that there is definitely um, you know the, you have the, there are um, you know there is um, evidence which shows that there is probably this person has been involved as far as money laundering is concerned then you can all you can go ahead and file a complaint but uh, interesting since it will it will be uh, part of it will be proceeds of forgery so forgery um, and money laundering are actually very different uh, 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 you know crimes here so if you see that it is proceeds of pmla money laundering then definitely go ahead and file a complaint before ed um, the ed will take it forward um, but but i doubt that that will actually work for you because forgery if something like forgery is happening then how is money laundering involved you will have to make a very good case out of it for the complaint to take a, a, a you know a possible uh, to for a complaint to convert into an investigation um also um i don't know how many of you know this but uh, one of the big cases which is going on just now the complainant himself has now become uh, an offender because he filed a complaint before the ed and now he is of course one of the accused persons in the matter so um always be treading with caution i would suggest yeah especially in these kind of matters <laughs> right yeah <laughs> Okay uh, now we have another question from uh, Sunil um though the question is not really clear to me um, i think pallavi will be able to understand if reason to believe to issue the notice for attachment turned out uh, not being a reason and subsequently the offender proved then uh, what the will the ed the order will go away it is bad in law you will get an order in your favor and that attachment will go away this is happening a lot of times by the way and there are <clears throat> so many times adjudicating authority if if you are not getting an order from the adjudicating authority you go in and appeal you will find that the appellate tribunal will definitely if there are uh, specific you 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 are able to show that there is 
no reason to believe as far as the proceeds of crime and attaching of property is concerned please by all means go before the adjudicating authority and if there is any dismissal order that comes and please go before the appellate tribunal you will get yourself uh, um, an order which will come in your favor this is happening so many times because you know we also have to understand that the investigating agencies probably overwork with uh, you know so many matters so for them it is probably that you know these 10 assets i can see and i'm going to freeze all the, those 10 assets then it is upon us to prove that no you know out of these 10 assets maybe two of them uh, you can think of um, as being part of proceeds of crime but the rest of the eight are actually not and this is for us to br bring about that there was no application of mind which was used when uh, the attachment was being done i hope that answers your question sunil Uh, so i think uh, we don't have any more questions um so i'll just quickly share my screen and i'll uh, uh, take you on a virtual tour to evc learning sets right excited about it yeah um so uh, i guess the screen is visible right yes it is all right so uh, this is for everyone and also for pallavi uh, this is ebc learning's website so it's ebclearning.com and uh, all you need to do is uh, if you want to obviously access all the courses so we have over 50 courses and interviews panel discussions etc and also we have all the previous webinars also all of them are uh, here in this so um, uh, all you need to do is you need to take a subscription and uh, of course if you have subscription you can uh, just log in with your id and basically if you scroll down you will find that we have a list of upcoming courses and talks so right now we have these in our uh, upcoming courses and talks plus we have a number of courses which are uh, already released we have some new releases uh, right now uh, one of them is uh, uh, from your field uh, pallavi it's about aor exams so cracking the aor exams no, then we can... have uh, yeah then we have uh an interesting course on building e-commerce uh from the legal uh, perspective then we have e-commerce is very important considering yes. uh, the consumer protection act yes. you know e-commerce has become a huge uh, yesterday the day before only there was a matter which was going on before supreme court and i think uh, it was very important that e-com a lot of people do not even know uh, that they are not e-commerce compliant so i think this will yeah. be a good course for all the lawyers Yes. yeah so uh, we have this course plus uh, related to that like you said consumer protection laws so we have two courses on uh, consumer protection laws as well so one is the basics of consumer protection the other is the practice and procedure so it's by uh, the same uh, person dr pratima narayan right. then we have a very interesting uh, new course which is on legal research and writing Uh, i think uh, especially uh, if any law students are watching this uh, particular webinar you should uh, actually go for at least uh, try to uh, you know go through this entire course because it's going to be really helpful for them plus of course we have contract law essential so the first module has already released which is on formation of contract and uh, in the upcoming we have a few more modules for that also coming up apart from that uh, there are some other courses also which are generally um, interesting and are going to be useful for law students professionals so one is contract drafting the other is arbitration then essential skills for legal profession mergers and acquisition so basically we have almost around um, a collection of 50 and up courses and talks which uh, people can view on our website the only thing is that you need to subscribe and uh, uh, that's it and uh, another thing is uh, that all those who have not subscribed to our youtube channel please uh, go forward and do it and uh, the youtube channel will of course uh, you'll be able to find our previous recordings of webinars plus this particular webinar like i said it was live and uh, obviously after this also it will be available so anyone who has uh, missed any part of the webinar can of course uh go back to it and uh, watch uh, the webinar recording so thank you very much uh, pallavi thank you vijaytri for having me here i am so happy to that you know finally we actually got to do a session which was not on insolvency yes exactly 
so uh, and it was a very interesting session in the sense that you know uh, like all these uh, new cases and all these new discussions that are going on about pmla about money laundering then about uh, what what actually should be the role of the officials uh, where do they you know sort of trespass uh, the responsibilities of the other authorities so uh, in that sense plus in the sense that uh, there definitely has been a lot of confusion about uh, these terms that are used in pmla especially uh, when we talk about uh, attachment and then confiscation mm-hmm. so there's a lot of confusion about that and uh, i'm really glad that uh, you did the session you explained uh, these basic terms plus it was a really uh, nice participation by our uh, attendees today with uh, all these interesting questions that uh, came up so thank you everyone uh, for uh, joining us today for this uh, webinar and uh, thank you pallavi once again thank um, you yeah so i'll just log out thank, thank you. you thank, thank you, you.